revisit Sarah Boone. We're going to break down and tear apart her body language as she's on trial and on the stand. And we're going to tell you what, what we think about it. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, so this week we're going to get a chance to do something a little different than we usually do. We're going to watch her testimony on cross by the prosecution. But we're also going to look back two years at a clip of her first interaction with the police and what we said two years ago. And let's see how that aged. So each of them has to put their name Normally in Normally we all just, I just put everybody. There you go, we're just working. Um, what's going on? Sorry, I just got here, so fill me in. No problem. Like, yeah, he and I were putting a puzzle together. We've been doing some artwork right together. together. You were putting a puzzle together? Yes, we have a puzzle that we started in there. Okay. We've been doing art, trying to take the stuff off the wall to, to make new art put up there. Like, having a good time with one another. But we're drinking. We had a bottle of wine last night. Okay. Wow. So then it's like, we decided to play hide and seek, right? Okay. So he gets in the suitcase. Okay. Who is this guy? That's my ex-husband. My former husband. How did he, he live here with you guys? No. I called him over here. Okay, okay. I didn't know what to do. Okay. I didn't know what to do. Okay. So then he came over here. Here, let's talk in private, okay? I called you guys. Mm-hmm. I you tried giving you a I, I, The problem is, is yeah. I fell asleep. I fell asleep. When did you do CPR? This morning. When I found him. Before you called? Yes! It's one o'clock right now. I tried... I was awake, but I actually got out of the bed at like 12.30ish, whatever. So I came downstairs hey, honey, brother, and I was like, oh, he's in the suitcase still. And that's when I found him and I took him out and okay, tried doing CPR and then I called him and then I called you guys. Did he get here before the fire department got here? Who? Your husband? Yes. Or your ex-husband? Yes. Okay. Where did he live at? Uh, right down the street. Okay. So you were playing and who dipped him up in I did, okay. but then I fell asleep. Okay, okay, so you're okay. I don't, I wasn't here. I'm just trying to figure out what happened. But I fell asleep, so I don't know if he's suffocated or like had an aneurysm or a heart attack or what. What kind of medical conditions does he have? None that I know of. Nothing that you know of. None that I take know any of. No, no, no. no. no All we had was a bottle of wine. Literally, okay. just a bottle of wine. Okay. Doing puzzle artwork. Then we decided to play hide and seek. Mm-hmm. That's all that happened. Okay, okay. So I don't know if he had a heart attack or what in there. Like, I don't know what happened. So how long were you doing CPR on him prior to you calling 911? You tried that all morning? Yes. Okay. And then I called him while I was what doing CPR. What time did you start? Probably giving me a rough ball. Yeah, if uh, she wants us to think that she is not heavily, heavily involved in this, it didn't go well from the start on this and I think the the officers who showed up right at the start we're getting a sense of that let's see where uh, the investigators take it but not a good start I would say Chase what do you think so I'm going to give you one nugget here you, you should probably write this down because it's a good one I think this comes down to does the person reasonably feel like they can predict their future do they know what's coming next? Guilty people are far less likely to feel like they, they know what's coming next or they can predict what's going to happen in their lives the next few days. Innocent people have no problem saying, I'm going to be in bed tomorrow night and, and the next night after that and the next night after that. So a lot of that comes down to that. And we see a whole video here with a person who has their ability to predict the future has gone to zero. Greg? Yeah, one thing we have to point out is you can be naive and believe all day that you have some control over your life and believe that simply by saying, I didn't mean to go to sleep, you could be absolved of any involvement in the person's death. That's not how the court system works. I say all the time, interrogation is an intentional outcome desired when you go in. So you're after getting something and finishing it. So this person may feel confident, may feel like she's confident because she doesn't understand the way the court system and the way law works. Every law has an ele- has elements that you have to satisfy to mean that the person has violated that rule and can be charged. And those can be very tricky. So while she has openly admitted, hey, I put him in the suitcase, I zipped it up, then I fell asleep. It's not my fault. That's not necessarily the way the courts will see it. So she may feel confident and may get be in for a rude awakening. Scott, what do you got? I think this is a great example of seeing somebody who comes into the situation with a story or their idea for a story, but they haven't had enough time to talk about it and think think about it, work their way through it, knock the things out of the way that don't sound right, to, to uh, um, verify it with themselves yet, make it sound true. And as she goes through, she starts adding these things and these fake emotions to start 
to, to look like she's really sincere about how surprised she was about she fell asleep and just can't believe that 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 happened because she fell asleep. I think it's I think it's a great example of seeing but somebody who's not very smart trying to um, almost take advantage of that, I think. Or may, I may be giving her too much credit, but um, I, it, I think it's a great example of seeing somebody get in there and try their hardest to find out what's going on for, you know, with the cops and finding out, trying to find out if they're going to be in trouble or not, as mm -hmm. they set up this little rinky dink, dink story to help protect themselves. So what'd you guys think about that, about us calling that early? Well, it seemed pretty obvious at the time. So <laughs> I mean, yeah, let's see how it plays out with this. Could have gone either yeah. way, but, uh, but seemed pretty obvious at the time. Yeah, I, think I think once so you too. see clusters of behavior like we did in that video, yeah. you're going to yeah. you're going to really be able to predict a lot with a lot greater accuracy once we see a lot of behaviors together like we did there. Yeah, I think so, too. All right. Well, let's take a look at uh, Sarah Boone in court. Um, it's going to be really interesting. So let's take a look. All right. Now, today you testified about the time frame between the two videos, correct? So you came down from the shower where you were hiding, correct? Yes. And as you're coming down the stairs, before you even get to the bottom of the stairs, you can kind of see over your shoulder or towards your right that he's trying to hide in the suitcase, correct? Yes. And the lid is down, but it's not closed, and you can, you can tell he's hiding in there. It's not a great hiding spot just yet, right? Correct. And so you come over to him, and you're laughing, right? Yes. And you move the suitcase around some before zipping it shut, right? No. No? You immediately zip it shut? Yes. Okay. And you're both still laughing about it, correct? Correct. All right. And then it's during this course of time. How quickly is it after you zip it shut that you begin filming the first video? I mean, the video is not going to catch you zipping him up because you're like 10 feet away, right? How, how quickly after you zip him up is it before the video starts is my question. I don't know. Okay. And then during that 9 minutes and 14 seconds is when he begins to get angry, correct? What 9 minutes? Then? Between the two videos. There's 9 minutes and 14 seconds between the end of 1061 and uh, the beginning of 10, six, or 1062 and 1063. So you got the two minute, three second video that starts at 11, 12, 45, correct? I guess. Permission to use state 17? You may. All right, Greg, what do you got? This is gonna be a really good one because we get the chance to look back at that plan she had when she met the cops in the first time. And let's see how that plays out on the stand. Very different. This is one of the best stress response video clips we've seen on this show, in my opinion. At the behavior panel, our goal is to help you see behind the surface to spot deception and analyze the true intent behind people's words. It is a mission that I personally feel strongly about in especially in today's bias and overwhelming media landscape. And mainstream media tends to blur the truth and make it really hard to see through the chaos. This is why all of us are proud to have Ground News as a sponsor. They help readers look beyond the mainstream narratives and uncover the patterns in the way that today's news really spins and frames the issues that are going on, or even just fails to cover them in the first place, like they don't even talk about it. So for every story that you read on their app or their website, you get instant access to every outlet that's reporting on that thing. On top of that, there's a breakdown of each source's political bias. For instance, you get this report of how subjective their reporting tends to be. And if they're independently owned, are they funded by corporations or governments? Are they getting their money from somewhere that's influencing what they're saying to you? So Ground News really helps you see the subtle ways that the media can very heavily shape our public opinion. I'm not even immune to it after studying all this psychology stuff, and it's good to be able to see behind the curtain. I'm actually in the process of writing a book. It's almost done. 
on media brainwashing. And I think they're one of the most practical solutions that I have ever seen. So check it out by scanning this QR code or go to ground.news slash TBP. Our viewers get 40% off unlimited access, whether you subscribe for yourself or if it's a gift for somebody. You know, Christmas is coming up. Ground News is independent and subscriber funded, not by any special interest. So by subscribing, you're not only just getting a great product, you're directly supporting our work here at the Behavior Panel. Fight or flight takes control of your body. One of the, the external things it does, all the things we're going to tell you to see, is, is only part of it. The other part is it starts to turn off your thinking brain and puts you in an odd situation. So let's talk about some of the outside parts. So when fight or flight hits, one of the first things we notice is people's thumbs rotate in. But the other things that are really clear to us and we see are pupil dilation, blink rate increase, respiration increase, blood leaving the face. Those are really easy to see and really easy to pay attention to. You can say, well, there's lighting or something wrong in the courtroom. This is a courtroom. There's plenty of light. Her pupils are dilated to take in all the data she possibly can. Now, the other thing that's interesting about fight or flight is it starts turning off your thinking brain. And if you're going to go in front of an, of an audience, in front of a jury, the last thing you want to do is turn into a jerk in front of the jury. And the other thing is, just like I always tell you guys about SEER, if you're in SEER, you can't recall all the memories. Chase and I will tell you we can't remember everything about SEER school because it was dark and it's all that memory is laid down under fight or flight. But when you get back in fight or flight, all of those feelings and all those things come back to the surface. So it's an opportunity for this person to be dragged into something and to say something they may not say otherwise because their strategy is in that frontal lobe and they're in, back in the moment. So it's a good opportunity. A couple other things. Uh, Scott, you always talk about resting face. She doesn't have a good resting face. It ain't mm -hmm. good. If you're going in front of a stand, you can't smile, but you certainly don't want to do what she's doing here. Um, she's, she's evasive. I don't know. And let's listen for that. Let's listen for that pronoun because we're here, or I'm sorry, that, that, uh, Contracted denial because she's starting off with I don't. Let's see if that changes anytime in this video. That's one way to resist. You can resist an interrogator. You can resist a prosecutor. You can resist people by saying, I don't know. I don't remember. But you better damn well remember to not remember when the time comes. So those are two setups she's doing in the beginning. She's confrontational. It feels a lot like when she was arguing with the two police officers in the interrogation room that we thought was one of the worst we'd ever seen. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, great points, man. Uh, there's a lot of increased blink rate as almost a baseline here. And we didn't see a lot of that in the body cam footage. We saw, I'm going to be fine tonight. I'm going to go back to my bed and I'm probably going to be okay. So when our blink rate speeds up, and this is how often we blink, not how fast. When our blink rate speeds up, it's typically stress. But a, not in alignment with a lot of the other body language stuff, when a blink rate is slow, it's not the opposite. Our blink rate slows down for focus, not relaxation. So there's a difference. So when a threat, a potential threat is unpredictable, blink rate goes down for focus because I don't know what to expect. Even when there's stress there, blink rate goes down for focus. So predictability of a threat increases blink rate. If I know something's going to happen and I know my future, my stress is there and I don't need to focus on a target because I know what's going to happen. The body's not needing to force the eyes open to stay alert to movements and stuff. So predictable threats are more likely to cause increases in blink rate, which we see here. Somebody, when somebody has no ability to predict what's going on and there's some kind of threat, whether it's social, financial, or even physical, the body prioritizes focus and that lowers blink rate. There's a lack of expressiveness here. Her body is on lockdown. And on a whole, innocent people are more likely to be expressive with their face and with their body. And I'm not seeing that here at all. Their pupils are large. They're like six to eight millimeters. But that may be baseline for this room. I doubt it. Uh, but let's keep an eye on it. Maybe it'll change. So if you're ever asking someone questions, you're going to hear a lot of this. And if you're an attorney, this is going to maybe make you upset. But overly leading statements. So some questions lead a witness to correct or I guess uh, answer without exploring any of the depth. And so instead of feeding the answer, the prosecutor examiner can ask more open-ended questions that encourage somebody to expand. So rather than you laughed about it, correct? 
something like, what was your reaction when you zipped him in? That's a good question. So I think it's a stark reminder of how deeply our experiences can can shape who we are. Uh, I was caught in an abusive relationship. There's some psychological struggles with PTSD, narcissism. And if you watch the video, maybe some sadism that, that complicated a lot of this. And it's a, a good look at how abuse and mental health can twist somebody's behavior. So always remember just to break down complex questions into simple, focused questions to control the flow of information, especially in situations like this. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. I, I can't believe this guy asked questions that way. I, it, it was, it was. I'm not going to say ridiculous. I'm not. I'm not an attorney. We've seen enough of that to know to know better than that. You'd think that he would have too. It's just like you were saying, correct? And yeah, so it lets her say yes or no. You don't get anything out of her. And in this thing, going back to blink rate, I thought from seeing this, I was like, you know what? I'm going to count all these. I'm going to count all the blink rates, and no matter what you guys say, boom, because no, 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 you guys would have done it. You would have given the rate. I tried to do it. It made me car sick. It's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible to do it in that short amount of time because all she's doing is blinking. There's so much going on here. It's fascinating to see the the combination of – it's not facial expressions on her face. She doesn't show any emotion, but it's everything else going on in her face. It's just bizarre. So she's she's got that stuff where she's um, – chewing on her mouth and moving her mouth around everything's moving and as these as these things happen you can see what I'm, I'm under the impression that that's when things are registering for her she, when she gets information it registers and that's what's happening along with her blink rate like that because they're both just moving right along but her her mouth stuff slows down it comes in 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 groups you know in clusters but the blink rate just pretty much spot on the whole time um and the mouth squinching, that thing, we've got to come up with a name for that. You know, it's not compression. It's not anything else. It's just this real weird. And some people are going to see some of these and go, oh, that's Duper's Delight. It's not. It's not Duper's Delight. It's just her, Her. it may be a, a, way, a way she's adapting as well. Because I started thinking, what is, how could somebody, number one, keep doing that for so long? I mean, just if you tried to blink that long, that fast for, for that amount of time, Man, it, I don't know. It would just be—it would be weird. It'd be really, really hard to do. So, from the questioning, all of her que all of her answers are short. They're tight. They're quiet. So all she has to do is say yes, no. Now those get a little bit bigger in a few minutes and a couple other videos. But but it's it's really the only expression we see really is sort of concern because that's in her brow. But that only comes after she's hearing specific in information as it registers. So it's. It's the concern of the question, I think. Maybe she's she's just already gone, I'm, I'm in trouble, and there's no way out of this, and I'm just going to talk about this but try to save my ego as much as I possibly can, whatever's left of it. But uh, I, I think this is really interesting because I've never seen this before, somebody blinking that much the whole time with their mouth going at the same time. Just thought it was really interesting with no emotions. She's not showing any emotion whatsoever. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, well, I've got 120 plus on the blink rate, and it's plus because I'm like, yo, I just couldn't count it. And I'm I like, stopped at 200. Like, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just such a lot at some points that I couldn't count it. What I do want people to do is to is to go back uh, on our commentary here, go back to Chase's and the moment when he mentions blink rate, because what you're going to see in me is the side of my mouth go up in disdain as he mentions blink rate the reason is is that's all i have to talk about here and and so i was hoping <laughs> that i would go before chase because you know chase has forgotten more about blink rate than i could ever you know know about it and so if you want to see a micro gesture of disdain that, and the reason it's disdain and not contempt is contempt is for a person. Disdain is for a group or a situation. And so my disdain was at the situation of, damn, like I, I'm, I'm, all my material has has gone now. <laughs> Apart, Scott, from mentioning that, like you, I couldn't make the count at That's all. It's just, impossible. it's just uh, too much. Here's what I here's what I and just like you, Scott, I think people should test themselves on trying to do that blink rate yeah. and seeing what happens in your mind, in your physiology, in your emotions when you're blinking at that 
rate because I, I mean, I'm sure we've seen blink rates like that before, but as you were saying, Chase, as a baseline almost, it's extreme. Now, obviously, we expect court to be um, stressful. Like, courts have been some of the most stressful places that I've ever been in, and I've been on the right side. <laughs> you know, I haven't been on the wrong side of it. You know, or if I have been on the defense side, it's like I'm not. I'm not the accused. I'm there helping defense. So, right. so it's like it's not my head on the chopping block at, at at this point. But it's still damn stressful. But even that stressful. Well, I think there's something else going on. Uh, Chase, before we leave this one, here's what I'd love to hear from you. Um, obviously, we've got kind of no blink rate at all, which would mean, I don't know, maybe somebody's got, gone into a coma with their eyes open. Um, what would be the blink rate per minute in your view? And I know it'll be kind of a, an avenue, but of, of extreme focus, what would we be kind of thinking of? Uh, extreme focus would be around three right. at, at an extreme level. So three a minute. Yeah, so like when yeah. I watched the movie Interstellar, which is yeah. one of my favorite movies, my blink rate was probably around a three. Like during the math portion of my SATs, which I suck at, right. it's probably like a 75 or 70. So okay. we can have- so, so once we're over, once we're 75 and over 70, we're into, would that be extreme stress or somewhat stressful? That's extreme. So anything over like 25 would be stress. Anything over 40, I would say, is maybe getting close to serious. Right. So if if we're if, if Scott and I are, are right, that we're reading like at times like 120, like there's sometimes yeah. it, in my view, it was three blinks a, a second. Mm. Like what, what, are we seeing just stress off the charts or could it be something else? There could be some kind of allergy. I highly doubt it. It's a courtroom. Yeah. They use the most sterile, boring, yeah. banal everything. Carpet, furniture, paint, you, you, you name it. Right. It can also be she's trying to ratchet down everything. And the more you ratchet, the more stuff leaks. That's just, right. we all know. It's so squeeze she, the balloon. So she, you know? Ramping herself up at the same time as getting ramped. Yeah. Up. Yeah, in, interesting. Interesting. Anyway, go back, look at that moment of disdain. That's that's what we call a, a, a micro gesture because it happens within microseconds, within mic within frames of a I second. I think in, in Greg's world, if we go back to horses, that that little skin twitch is what they do when there's a fly on them. So maybe we could name it the fly twitch. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, yeah. And they move their mouth when they're thinking. I think that's she's trying to absorb some horror. So that's a good call. You know, it's interesting, Chase. So I was I was looking at, um, at scientific studies on on blink rate. There are not just scientific studies of human beings on blink rate. There's a whole bunch of social mammal uh, studies blink rate, including horses, because uh, horses it's very easy to see their blink because the eyes yeah. are so big. And it's much easier to kind of note uh, a, a blink and a partial blink with them. So I, I, I stumbled across all these studies, scientific studies on horse blink rate today. Anyway, right. have you have you guys ever seen somebody sleep with their eyes open? Yeah, of course. You have? Yeah. Dude, the first time I saw it, it scared me to death. We were on a we were on a bus. I was with this band because I was good. I was yeah. producing their record. And this guy, you know how you get in the, you have little bunks and you have this little thing that you close, like a little door, little curtain door on it while you're laying there. This guy forgot to close his because we were doing, we were goofing around or something. And he just left his open. And I looked over at him and he was asleep and his eyes were, were, were open. And I was like, oh my, yeah, I thought he was dead or something. And I was like, oh my God. And they said this cat, his eyes were open all the time when he slept. It was just normal for him. I'd never seen that before. We have all Caged people, somebody in a coma with their glasses still on. I remember yeah. that. <laughs> Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> Billy, Billy Bunter. Yeah. Billy Bunter. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, today you testified about the time frame between the two videos, correct? Yes. So you came down from the shower where you were hiding, correct? Yes. And as you're coming down the stairs, before you even get to the bottom of the stairs, you can kind of see over your shoulder or towards your right that he's trying to hide in the suitcase, correct? Yes. And the lid is down, but it's not closed, and you can you can tell he's hiding in there. It's not a great hiding spot just yet, right? Correct. And so you come over to him, and you're laughing, right? Yes. 
And you move the suitcase around some before zipping it shut, right? No. No? You immediately zip it shut? Yes. Okay. And you're both still laughing about it, correct? Correct. All right. And then it's during this course of time, how quickly is it after you zip it shut that you begin filming the first video? I don't know without watching it. I don't, I don't know. Okay. I mean, the video's not going to catch you zipping him up because you're like 10 feet away, right? How, how quickly after you zip him up is it before the video starts is my question. I don't know. Okay. And then during that 9 minutes and 14 seconds is when he begins to get angry, correct? What, nine minutes? Then? Between the two videos. There's nine minutes and 14 seconds between the end of 1061 and uh, the beginning of 10, six, or 1062 and 1063. So you got the two minute, three second video that starts at 11, 12, 45, correct? I guess. Permission to use state 17? You may. Three one 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 three. A second movie is captured at eleven twenty three oh three p.m. Your testimony was that after that first video was captured by your phone and you, Mr. Torres began getting angry and trying to push his way out. Correct. Say it one more time, please. Between these two movies, of which there is about nine minutes and fourteen seconds, Mr. Torres begins to get angry and try and push his way out and get out of the suitcase. Correct. He had been angry on and off throughout the entire day. Okay. You didn't tell us that earlier. You said it was a wonderful, fun day all day, correct? That's because I lived. Okay. But you did not tell us earlier today that he had been angry throughout the day. When would I say that? You described your entire day of doing puzzles and arts and crafts and outside by the dartboard, and you said it was a wonderful day and everything was fun. Uh, until he was in the suitcase. Did you not testify to that earlier today? I did. Okay. My specific question between these two movies is, this is when he begins to get angry and trying to push his way out and to get out of the suitcase, correct? Angry again, yes. Okay. And he was expressing his anger in what manner? How did he say this? At which point throughout the day? Ma'am, you know very well that I'm talking about between these movies. Please answer my question. Between these two movies, how did he express his anger with you? Told me that I was going to fucking die. Okay. Now this is happening after he's already told you several times he cannot breathe in the suitcase, correct? Correct. And he's been in there for whatever brief amount of time it took you to zip him up and it's the laughter stops and then you go over and begin to film correct yes. and you're filming your purpose of filming is to kind of teach him a lesson this is your chance to say something to him when he can't say anything back to you correct no then correct me there was no lesson to be learned it was just i wanted him to try to understand how I felt so maybe he could progress in being a better person the next day. So you wanted him to understand how you felt in the past and that's not teaching a lesson? I just wanted him to understand. Okay. Uh, Chase, what do you got? There's a key moment in here. I think that perfectly shows the blink rate shift. When the prosecutor is asking about it being a wonderful, fun day, I think like that. And mm -hmm. she replies with, that's because I lived. Wow. There's a, there's a perfect stoppage in blink rate for a few seconds there. And in my view, the degree to which she could predict how things are going fell to zero as she needed more focus to process that temporarily and maybe for two reasons either a she needed to assess how the answer was received like his reaction how is he reacting to it or she needed to demonstrate an appropriate facial expression for effect maybe both 
Um, but she's breathing into her chest, uh, which is where we're, we breathe into our chest when we're stressed. We breathe into our abdomen when we're relaxed. If you go watch somebody sleeping with their eyes closed, uh, you'll see them breathing into their abdomen. And you see people breathe the higher up into their body, the more stressed they are. Um, as an extreme pro tip, if you're ever preparing a client to go on the stand like this and you need them to breathe into their abdomen and you want to give them something to pacify and self-soothe on, you wrap an ACE bandage, not too tight, around the lower abdomen. It forces awareness down to that area and lets them self-soothe just by breathing into the abdomen and helps them look more calm to a jury. Um, anyway, so you could use it in a job interview too if you wanted to. But the responses here show that she's trying to control the story, downplay her role. She first describes the day as wonderful, maybe to soften up some negative lead up. And then she ad admits or says that Torres, is that his name? Yeah, I think his name was Torres, was angry and struggling. But she she filmed everything to teach him a lesson. So the shift in motive suggests she's uncomfortable with her real intent and she's reframing everything to look justified. And I think her lack of concern for his distress shows absolute detachment and maybe to avoid feeling responsible. And maybe Scott has another opinion on why that's happening. But her uh, deflections when she's pressed reveal some discomfort with what her actions imply. If that sentence makes any sense. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, Chase, I agree with you. I, I love the putting something around your abdomen because it forces you to think. It doesn't just force you to think about your abdomen. The mere fact of thinking forces your thinking brain back online instead of your reactive brain responding. It's the same reason for curling your toes or any of that stuff. But that's brilliant because it forces them to, at the same time, appear to be comfortable. And that's an important factor in that. So what I think is happening here is she came with a plan on what to say. I believe that last time and I still believe it. She had a plan. She thought this, if I say I fell asleep because I was drunk, it'll be okay. Everything will be okay, no matter what happened. And I think she's coming with that in mind. She tries to parse words when he's asking her about the time between those two videos. And then when he calls her on the carpet, watch, you see something very quick happen. She makes it a little abrupt lean back, her blink rate rockets through the through the roof, but she also eye blocks, which is kind of weird, kind of weird. That's a weird mix. Then she does that condemning scowl, that kind of bulldog face. When he asks, did you want to teach him a lesson? I think what we're seeing there is residual emotion. I don't think it's at him at all. I think it's back in the moment because she's feeling all that fight or flight, and it sure seems like she is not thinking here. She says some genuine confusion, in my opinion, and maybe her frontal lobe is disengaged as she's trying to figure out what he's talking about when he's talking about teaching a lesson. Because what she just described is teaching this guy a lesson, but she misses a key opportunity. If she was going to say, I was afraid for my life, he telegraphs that to her. He says, what did he say to you? I'm going to kill you. Well, if she were in her thinking brain, she might say, and that's the reason I didn't let him out. But she doesn't. I'm going to teach him a lesson. And then she forgot to not remember, just use that for a second, if that makes any sense, Chase, to your point. If your posture, when you're resisting an interrogator, when you're trying to get away is I don't remember, then you have to always not remember, not at opportune times not remember. So it becomes kind of a game here. She forgot not to remember. And so she's in a bind. One key note, she should have a whole lot of stress in front of a court. Guess how many attorneys she had fired by July? Any guess? Nine. Eight is what I, by July, she might've fired the ninth one too. Uh -huh. I don't know who's representing her here, but she clearly doesn't have great counseling. Nobody's prepared her or she's maybe did not listen to their preparation. So all the stuff we're talking about that her, her attorneys would have done, she knew better. That's a bad sign. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So um, I, Chase, I was going to talk about breathing rate uh, as well. But this time, <laughs> this time there was no disdain on this because I'm now just resigned to it. I'm now just resigned. It's just like, oh, there it, there it goes. There it goes again. So if you want to reel back uh, when Chase starts talking about breathing rate, which is really the only thing Wait. I have to talk about here. I, on, I only did breathing location. Yeah, 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 but that's what, that's what, sorry, that's what I was, I was going to talk about that as well. I mean, it's, uh, whatever happens, Chase, it's, it's lessened the impact of, of, of me. Just, you know, it's, it's almost destroyed me. 
I'm here. sorry so, for your loss. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you, so you're going you know, you. to see a man <laughs> scrabbling, scrabbling back here. This is, this is Mark scrabbling, scrabbling back. Um, so, yeah, breathing rate, uh, <laughs> I'm only reiterating you, Chase. It's high. Uh, it's high. And the reason we can see it's high is she's chosen... Uh, to wear all black, which is an interesting look given the given the situation. I'm not saying there she should be in you know red and lace and you know whatever or or or, or you know bold blue or patterns or, but all black is a, is definitely has connotations to it. Certainly in the in our you know uh, Western uh, you know US culture for sure it has strong death connotations she's got this v neck which makes it very easy to read that that breathing rate you want to look out for that contrast happens because white skin uh black v neck we're gonna we, the the v is gonna stay uh constant other than any movement in it and we're gonna see the contractions and the expansions there it's easy to see the breathing rate, it, it is high and it's relatively rapid and big. It looks to me, I would read it as aggressive. Now, to your point, Greg, uh, and I think Chase as well, is it uh, aggressive because uh, she's harking back to the aggression that was put on her or aggression that she might have felt at the time, um, which would be that teaching a lesson aggression, or is it a fight and flight around the aggression she's staying, saying was was put towards her? Or is it aggression in the moment? Well, she does put forward a chin of defiance as well. Now, again, is that the defiance of the moment back then? Is it the defiance of the moment now? Well, I'm not a mind reader, so I don't know where it's placed in in time. I mean, maybe I could make approximations based on more information, but I don't have the information there. But certainly to me, she's looking... Uh, aggressive, uh, defiant, and then you put that with the blink rate. So I'd love you at, at, at home right now or in your office or wherever you are and watch out what happens, you know, due to this. But do that blink rate and breathe high in your chest at that rate and depth as well and see how you start to feel. And it's probably hopefully not a feeling that you feel very often. If you feel that that feeling a lot, then then I would say... Go and, you know, go and talk to a friend or family member trusted or, you know, somebody professional about feeling like that a lot, because that is really high anxiety and aggressive anxiety. In in my mind, you might feel something different. It could be different for you. But I would put a gamble that you're going to feel pretty much like that. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. Thanks. So anyway, and I think her clothes, let's talk about her clothes a bit. I don't think those are hers. I don't think she picked that up because they don't fit properly. See, I thought you were going to you were going to bring that up, so I, I totally wiped my, got my next out. But her her sleeves are too long. Her shoes, she's not used to walk around those shoes. Maybe it's because she's been in I don't know what prison shoes are or what they look like. Maybe they're tennis shoes or something. She doesn't look comfortable wearing that stuff, and I'm sure or the way she's treated attorneys up to this point, it was one of their jobs to go, we got to get her some clothes to do this. And said, so just get her, go out and get her something. So they sent, you know, the the runner to go get, so you'll pick her up some clothes, what size, you know, told him the size and she wouldn't pick them up or he wouldn't pick them up, whoever did. So I think that's what's happening there. I don't think that was thought out at all here. And I think for them, they already see this as an easy win. You know, it's just, it's, you just have to lob stuff in there and get through it and they'll be fine. So I don't think they they were worried about that. So I think that's what's up with the clothes because they're not fitting well. But this is the first time that her cadence, voice tone, and volume are all fairly stable as she's talking through here. So and and then we see lip person and that mouth movement is I, I really believe that's the way she's reg she's registering what's happening when she takes an info. She's registering that, and it increases a little bit as she's structuring what's going on. Or, or, or what's what her answer is going to be because she actually has has answers on this one because when she says there was no lesson to be learned here she's really really careful and clear with that like there was no lesson to be learned here so that that which makes sense because she's trying to what little is left of, of her ego to save unless some part of her ego said well you're right you're right and no matter what happens you're going to feel good about this I I, th I think that's that's pretty much gone, but she must have a little wall there. She's trying to stick up for that, and she's still showing a little bit of concern in the brow, 
and but still combined with that blank expression. So it's all happening right up in here, but nothing other than those weird mouth moves and that blink rate has changed interface at all. So no no emotion whatsoever. Doesn't feel bad about this when they bring up the guy or his name or anything. Nothing. Nothing hits her weird. It's, this is a person who's, well, I don't know if she's doesn't have the ability to show emotion or have emotion, but she sure isn't showing any at all. Not even a little bit. Okay. 31113. A second movie is captured at 11.23.03 p.m. Your testimony was that after that first video was captured by your phone and you, Mr. Torres began getting angry and trying to push his way out, correct? Say it one more time, please. Between these two movies, of which there's about 9 minutes and 14 seconds, Mr. Torres begins to get angry and try and push his way out and get out of the suitcase, correct? He had been angry on and off throughout the entire day. Okay. You didn't tell us that earlier. You said it was a wonderful, fun day all day, correct? That's because I lived. Okay. But you did not tell us earlier today that he had been angry throughout the day. When would I say that? You described your entire day of doing puzzles and arts and crafts and outside by the dartboard, and you said it was a wonderful day and everything was fun uh, until he was in the suitcase. Did you not testify to that earlier today? I did. Okay. My specific question between these two movies is, this is when he begins to get angry and trying to push his way out and to get out of the suitcase, correct? Angry again, yes. Okay. And he was expressing his anger in what manner? How did he say this? At which point throughout the day? Ma'am, you know very well that I'm talking about between these movies. Please answer my question. Between these two movies, how did he express his anger with you? He told me that I was going to fucking die. Okay. Now this is happening after he's already told you several times he cannot breathe in the suitcase, correct? Correct. And he's been in there for whatever brief amount of time it took you to zip him up and it's, the laughter stops and then you go over and begin to film, correct? Yes. And you're filming. Your purpose of filming is to kind of teach him a lesson. This is your chance to say something to him when he can't say anything back to you, correct? No. Then correct me. There was no lesson to be learned. It was just I wanted him to try to understand how I felt so maybe he could progress in being a better person the next day. So... You wanted him to understand how you felt in the past, and that's not teaching a lesson? I just wanted him to understand. Okay. This is image 1061, taken at 11.03 p.m., 31 seconds. Does this appear to be the blue suitcase that's in the two videos that were captured at 11.12 and 11.23 p.m.? Correct. Did you take this image at 11.03 p.m.? I don't remember if I did or not. And again, we had, uh, and by we, I mean you and Mr. Torres, two 1.5 liters bottles of wine and plus whatever was left over from the day before, correct? Correct. So do you, you don't remember taking this photograph? I don't. Do you remember whether or not Mr. Torres was in here? I don't remember taking the photo. Okay. So what is your memory of what happens between 11.03 p.m. and 31 seconds when that image is captured and then when the movie starts at 11.12.45. What do you remember? I don't. Okay. Do you remember anything from that night? I do. You told the police on February, or February 25th, 2020, when they first showed you the video, that you didn't remember taking that. Do you remember that? I do. And your testimony is you do remember taking that video. I do. But you don't remember taking that photograph nine minutes prior. Correct. Is there something, did you have more to drink in those nine minutes? I did not. Was Mr. Torres in that suitcase? 
the entire time between 11.03 when that image was taken and then when the second video was taken at 11.23 p.m.? I believe so, yes. So for 20 minutes? Yes? However long the time frame is. Did he begin telling you that he couldn't breathe before the video or do you not remember? I don't remember. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so remember when I asked you to go back and look at that disdain that I showed about, you know, Chase grabbing that moment on uh, on blink rate, just ripping it, ripping it from me. Uh, I think you do see disdain in her on this. Now, there's a lot, and, and I think, Scott, you're right. I don't think you're seeing dupers here. I think yeah. you're seeing disdain on this. Now, having said that, there is a lot going on there. There's some kind of chewing the side of the mouth that goes on. I think that could be um, an, an adapter, uh, to your point there, Scott, or even if it's repetitive, a self, self-soothe there. Again, it, it's, so, it's happening so often. There's so much animation in the face that it's, it's almost a, a baseline throughout. But, we've, but, but we do have somewhat of a baseline for her under some stress because we saw her in front of the the cops, you know, um, many, many months or maybe even years ago, was it now? Mm. That's a long time ago. But we saw her under stress there and we hadn't got that mouth chewing going on and this and this uh, side of the mouth going up in uh, disdain. And then there's also lip compressions that start happening again. So we've got chew of the mouth, Side up into stone, lip, I can't even do it. Lip compressions going on. There's a lot happening all at once that's tough. I would say to, to it's happening so quick that it's tough to work out what exactly might it be about. I will leave that to my colleagues to, to, to make a, you know, throw, throw some more precise darts uh, uh, in, into that one. But all I will say is such extreme animation even as a baseline in this situation, has to say something about some extreme stress going on right now. Is it that she is constantly making up story here? Is it that she is has not been prepared by anybody because she keeps firing everybody who could give her any preparation show if she is completely at sea uh, there? Uh, it could be any, any and all of those, I would say. Uh, Greg, what are your thoughts about this one? I'm going to go back to something Chase said in the end of last video. When a person believes that they have control and they're going home that night, there's a very different mindset. And when she came in, if you remember, she thought she had control. And I said then it's naive thought of control. But she had a story she's going to tell, and she's going to be emphatic and tell you all that. That's gone. Mm -hmm. You guys talk all the talk about compressors. She's compressed. She is compressed. She's not using any body language to say what she's thinking, any of that. And so I think what's happening is – that thing that you're talking about, Chase, where once you realize you've lost control, you stop being, you know, you, there's no longer any of that. And there's uncertainty and all the ramping up of body language. We're seeing all of that. There's a couple of things that are going on here. She remembers to forget something that has absolute evidence. So it's a waste of her time. When the guy says, what time did you take this picture of this luggage? Well, of course she did. It's on her phone. And they know what time. But she says, I don't remember. She has had somebody prepare. And if you don't believe that, she answers, I don't, I do, correct. She doesn't volunteer information. So somewhere in those eight attorneys, somebody said, don't volunteer information on the stand. And she remembers that. This thing she's doing in her mouth, in my opinion, is nothing more than internalizing and thinking. It's adapting, yes. But if you watch little kids, I always say, if, you, if your parents are not going, hey, stop doing that, you would be walking around at work going, because little kids do that when we're thinking our mouth is moving and all that. I think that's part of what we're seeing. And Mark, you stole one of mine. <laughs> so payback, Good disdain, <laughs> the disdain. I love the disdain piece because it's at a key moment. It's when they, she says, I don't remember taking the photo. So far we're hearing don't and do. We haven't heard do not yet. That's a good sign. She realizes she's in a bind, and I think we're seeing a whole lot of that. I think all that twisting mouth, all those things are telling us that she's in a bind. And then she does something that I always think is a person moving to realize that adversarial is not working for them. She goes that front of the mouth. She starts talking soft. It's changing. That's probably a good thing for her in front of the in front 
of a jury. Remember, me getting into a pissing contest from the attorney is not doing me any favors when I'm on the stand because guess who's watching when I get into that? And she needs to be keenly aware of that as she's moving forward. Scott, what do you got? All right. I just figured out what she looks like when she's doing the blink and thinking, moving her mouth. Can anybody guess? Anybody know? I know exactly what it looks like. I got it. You know, those, those things where people do time-lapse photos of them, you know, I didn't eat sugar for a year or I didn't grow my hair. I didn't cut my hair for four years. And it's that thing where they're going, they're still, but they're going, their mouth is moving, their eyes are blinking and stuff really quick. That's what she looks like. <laughs> Think about that when we watch these again. That's exactly what it looks like, a time-lapse video of photos over like a year, two-year span. Okay. So her blink rate is actually higher now, believe it or not, I mean, which is mind-blowing. But the only time it slows down is when the attorney starts asking her about details. Why is that? Because she's got to think about what's happening. So all that internal dialogue is going on. She's structuring and thinking about her answer. Takes away from those things. It doesn't lower her stress any, but it takes away. It takes her, in other words, it takes her mind off the stress as she's thinking about what to say, because it goes right back into that once she finishes answering the question. Once she gets that done, so when she's when she's thinking and sorting and structuring, that's when that stuff starts slowing down. And then it'll speed up a little bit as she's registering it. Her breath rate increases as her voice gets higher. Because this lets us know, again, she's getting even more stressed. But we're not seeing that from facial expressions on her face. A little bit of concern still in there. But there's no, there's none of the classic hallmarks of stress we see in a facial expression. It's really, really weird. Really, really weird. You guys have already gone over the breathing stuff. So, Chase, what do you got? Now we're seeing these very selective memory gaps that Greg was talking about earlier especially around the photo that she doesn't remember taking just minutes before the videos she clearly remembers. So this, what you're seeing right here, this can be a way to avoid acknowledging something that might look incriminating. So she's also bringing up uh, some heavy drinking, maybe to hint that alcohol affected her memory or her judgment, but she denies drinking more in those specific nine minutes. Interesting. When she's asked if, uh, Torres was in the suitcase the entire 20 minutes between the photo and the video. She just says yes, without showing any concern at all. I think this is a scary level of detachment here. So her pattern of remembering some details, but not the others, I think shows that she might be trying to dodge all responsibility by controlling how this story sounds, that she's uncooperative, no remorse, no emotional response. There's non-contracted denials in this video here. Blink rate is still very high. She's unwilling to admit that she, that likely she took the photo of the suitcase. Not sure why that would be a big deal to say, yeah, I probably took that. Avoiding questions. Says she remembers nothing between the videos, but reassures us that he was telling her she would die in that time. During that time that she cannot remember anything about she reassures us he told her she would die and that she's sure she didn't drink in that time frame. So knowing what you heard and whether or not you had a drink to most people would be less important than someone telling you uh, they couldn't breathe. She can't remember if he said that. That's a big deal. This is image 1061 taken at 11... 03 p.m. 31 seconds. Does this appear to be the blue suitcase that's in the two videos that were captured at 11.12 and 11.23 p.m.? Correct. Did you take this image at 11.03 p.m.? I, I don't remember if I did or not. And again, we had, uh, and by we, I mean you and Mr. Torres, two 1.5 liters bottles of wine and plus whatever was left over from the day before, correct? So do you, you don't remember taking this photograph? I don't. Do you remember whether or not Mr. Torres was in here? I don't remember taking the photo. Okay. So what is your memory of what happens between 11.03 p.m. and 31 seconds when that image is captured and then when the movie starts at 11.12.45? What do you remember? 
Do you remember anything from that night? I do. You told the police on February, or February 25th, 2020, when they first showed you the video, that you didn't remember taking that. Do you remember that? I do. And your testimony is you do remember taking that video. I do. But you don't remember taking that photograph nine minutes prior. Correct. Is there something, did you have more to drink in those nine minutes? I did not. Was Mr. Torres in that suitcase the entire time between 11.03 when that image was taken and then when the second video was taken at 11.23 p.m.? I believe so, yes. So for 20 minutes? Yes? However long the time frame is. Did he begin telling you that he couldn't breathe before the video or do you not remember? I don't remember. Now, you testified moments ago that um, your two neighbors must have misremembered which night the loud noise was, correct? Yes. And now you're telling us that you don't remember taking the photograph at 11.03 p.m., correct? Correct. Did the police come out to your uh, townhouse on Sunday, February 23rd, 2020? Yes. I'm talking about Sunday. This is the Sunday fun day when we're going to Publix twice. Were the police out of your residence? No. It was the day after, Monday the 24th. Correct? Yes. And that Monday morning, you called 911, well, Monday afternoon at about 1 p.m., correct? Yes. And between that time frame, you were the only person in your apartment plus Mr. Torres in the suitcase, correct? Yes. So if anything had been disturbed in your apartment, you had all the time that you wanted to to undisturb them before calling 911, correct? If I wanted to. Okay. And you still, your testimony is there was no loud boom that shook the walls of your townhouse at about 11 p.m. the night of February 23rd, 2020, correct? To the best of your memory, correct? Correct. All right. Chase, what do you got? I think she realizes the trap that she got put into here. This, in chess, is called the Sicilian defense. This is controlling the center indirectly and setting up a trap, waiting for somebody to overextend. And and she did it. And she I think she realized it. I kept waiting on the one question that will set up the long game here. So I keep wanting the prosecutor to ask her, are you do you consider yourself a reasonable person? That's it. If you do that early, that sets up the prosecutor's Sicilian defense, that one question that sets everything up for you. I'm not going to go into all the detail of why, uh, but you can figure it out on your own. We're seeing the same mouth grooming, blink rate shifts, lockdown behavior here, but her strategy is now between incompetence, drunkenness, and victim versus intelligent, rational thinker. So it seems here that she's starting to realize she should have picked only one side of the fence to stay on. And that's the face that you're seeing here. This is a common tactic for guilty people where they'll display what I call selective incompetence around little tiny elements of an event. And then they're going to display logic and reason for all the other things. So this strategy is not fully conscious. It's not something that worked as uh I'm sorry, it's usually something that worked for us as a child. And then uh, if somebody has an average adult life with no real challenges, the strategy generally keeps working. And most people in their life won't call them out or don't really care enough to notice. That's why, in my opinion, I think we're seeing this here. I think this strategy has been used a lot longer than we think, maybe from a, like middle school time frame uh, that far back. Scott, what do you got? 
I agree. She, this is a, this is an immature person. I, I don't think her brain developed and, I, and I'm not saying that. Uh, yeah. Well, usually people who get into drugs when they're really young, that's pretty much when your brain development stops in a lot of, in a lot of cases, especially, especially with a lot of alcohol. So I, I think we're dealing with, with a lot of that things that have, that have come from her youth, you know, being into probably alcohol and drugs. I'm not saying, I don't know for sure, but boy, it sure looks like it to me. Um, so don't hold me to that. Um, her facial expression really hasn't changed much at all in these four videos. This is why it just keeps, I want to say it keeps getting weirder and weirder, but it's just, it goes to weird and just stays there pretty much. So the only thing that has changed is her blink rate slows down a little bit and her voice tone and volume or cadence speeds up and slows down just a bit here and there. So for me, not adding all the stuff you just added, there's nothing for me anyway, much to add here. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a really good example of this guy. He's hanging her with a rope she brought. I was drunk. I don't remember. And he starts, and she realizes it because you can see it in her body language. He starts to brand her with, were you so drunk you don't remember a really loud noise that night? And if she says yes, now he's got somewhere to go. If she says no, he's like, well, you remember, you don't remember that, but you remember this. So to your point, Chase, he is he's taking the same rope she's been using to get herself out of a hole and hang her with it. She's in a bind here and she realizes that. There's some confusion or concern, whichever we want to call it, right in her brow. And she realizes that. And you can see when she says, I don't remember, I misremembered, that is a bind for her. And you see all the all the usual stuff. We see blink rate really go through the roof here. We see downright eye accessing and eye blocking that we haven't seen till now. Her breathing increases. Mark your point. You can see because of the V-neck. And she chair swivels. We haven't seen that yet. This is a place I'd want to dig in and say, did he get in that suitcase? Or did you put him in there after something happened that created a loud noise? Or did you throw him down the stairs once he was in? I'd poke and prod a whole lot here. But he doesn't. I don't think he needs to. I think she's in a bind here and she knows it. And she, if she had a really good attorney, he probably would have said, hold on, hold on. You know, that kind of thing. Don't know what kinds of things she had worked out with her attorney, what they're allowed to do and not do. We're going to see her do something really stupid in a few minutes. But this is the beginning of her realizing, I call it realization one. This is realization one. I'm in a real bind. He's got me. And this rope is not my friend. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, if you're a subscriber, and actually it's, it's most statistically likely that you're not, strangely enough. So, But if you are a subscriber and you listen to us uh, a lot and watch us a lot, you'll know we constantly talk about change. In fact, change, seeing change is more important than really what you're seeing in that change. Being able to notice something is different is the key, and then digging into why is something different. And this person's quite a busy person. There's a lot going on, but we do see quite a change on uh, the neighbors must have misremembered. The neighbors must have misremembered that there was there was uh, a lot of noise at the time. Blink rate shoots right up at that point. We get a look of contempt. That side of the mouth comes up in contempt. Um, there's another contempt. There's a lip compression. And there's something else in there. And if only I could read my own writing, I would know the, <laughs> the other one in there. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put up my notes to to four we'll all put our notes together i'm going to put up my notes to to video four they'll be in a little subscription link down below you just hit the link and and those notes will be sent to you i want you to tell me what on earth i've written because it's come to a point in my life where i cannot read my own handwriting anymore it's come to that point please somebody else help me read it for me download those notes and email back and Tell me what the, on earth I'm talking about here. Scott, let's have another one. <laughs> oh, if you haven't subscribed, then go ahead and I see what you're saying, Mark. You know, our demo, speaking of our demographic and subscribing, just think you could you could look into Chase's eyes every Thursday at 1230 Eastern just for about an hour and a half, two hours sometimes or longer <laughs> if you wanted to. Think about that. So subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Now, you testified moments ago that um, your two neighbors must have misremembered which night the loud noise was, correct? Yes. And now you're telling us that you don't remember taking the photograph at 11.03 p.m., correct? Correct. Did the police 
come out to your uh, townhouse on Sunday, February 23rd, 2020? Yes. I'm talking about Sunday. This is the Sunday fun day when we're going to Publix twice. Were the police out of your residence? No. It was the day after, Monday the 24th. Correct? Yes. And that Monday morning, you called 911, well, Monday afternoon at about 1 p.m., correct? Yes. And between that time frame, you were the only person in your apartment plus Mr. Torres in the suitcase, correct? Yes. So if anything had been disturbed in your apartment, you had all the time that you wanted to to undisturb them before calling 911, correct? If I wanted to. Okay. And you still, your testimony is there was no loud boom that shook the walls of your townhouse at about 11 p.m. the night of February 23rd, 2020, correct? To the best of your memory, correct? Correct. Now you indicated that Mr. Torres would use your phone to look at pornography? Correct. Were there ever any points in times when it was you that was used looking at pornography? Um, if I was, it was to go back and look to see. Did you ever threaten to get Mr. Torres arrested if he did not do what you wanted him to do? I wouldn't say threaten. Okay. Well, were there ever points in times where you would like him to call you or return a call, and if he didn't do that, um, you would threaten to get him arrested? It depends on if he had my keys or something that I needed from him. Okay. And it was your townhouse, correct? Mine, yes. Flush hours. Well, you, when did you get him off the lease? Uh, I, I'm not sure what um, year it was, but I don't think he was actually removed from the lease. Okay. I think he was made a different type of tenant. And did you change the locks so that he couldn't get back in at the points of times when you picked him out? I did, sometimes. Okay. And then would you leave the key in the hiding spot that he was aware of? On any of the 911 calls, did you ever mention that Mr. Torres was aware of where you kept your keys and that's how he got back into the house? I didn't know I needed to. Okay. He would never break into my home. Hey, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, here we go again. She's parsing words. Very specifically, when the guy says threatened, well, I never really threatened him. Well, hold on, but then you go on to say you did threaten him. She's parsing words, but she's talking in the front of her mouth again. I wouldn't say threatened. Well, what would you say? And I would ask her a question. I would say, I'd look right dead at her when she says, I only threatened him if he had my keys or something I need. I'd say, then the answer is yes. Is that correct? And put her on notice. But he doesn't need to. She's in a bind and she knows it. If you watch, she's got that heavy swallow, which means she realized this is another mistake. And then she evades the question about the keys. Did you ever put keys where he knew there would be? And then she goes and just outright avoids the question and says, keys were put in a lot of places. So it's interesting. I think we have realization, too, that she's in a bind. And she's sliding down that hill, Chase, back to where we we're talking about she's lost control. She knows she's lost control. You have to ask yourself, what made her wake up and say, I want to get on the stand? Maybe she had a story to tell that she thought she had control over. Chase, what do you see? Might have been the same thing that made her fire eight or nine <laughs> attorneys. <laughs> Arrogance. Uh, but let's let's talk about a military term here. I want to teach you a military term, and this is called a force multiplier. So a force multiplier is something that significantly boosts the effectiveness or combat effectiveness of a military force, like advanced technology, super elite training, uh, really strong alliances, good communications. It's like having a secret weapon and makes you stronger and more capable than the enemy. So she seemed to use the police as a relationship force multiplier. 
and a way to gain leverage and compliance. With this kind of behavior, I'm willing to bet that there's a pattern where this is a very common reaction to needing to gain the upper hand. She might search for these elements of how can I find a force multiplier in this relationship to give me the upper hand in everyday life. So if you look at what a, false, a force multiplier is, uh, in reality, the suitcase, if you think about this from her brain's perspective, that suitcase was a force multiplier that gave her leverage and control. Um, when she's talking about the, the pornography thing, there's an incomplete answer. This is the most evasive and deceptive she's been so far. I'm not sure why she needs to be so evasive with these questions. Let me know in the comments if you know the case really well. But when you hear accents on words that are unusual, like when she says she would, I think she says she would threaten to have him arrested if he didn't answer the call and says something I needed from him, from him. Pay attention to when you hear these. The emphasis would usually be added on the word needed, something I needed from him. I've seen this dozens of times in audio recordings uh, where that was all we could look at. There was no video there. It was just an audio of an interrogation. And almost every time there was deception in the form of o omission or avoidance there. Uh, and that's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So let me see if I can be a force multiplier to you there, Chase. Let me see. Uh, look, here's what we see here, I think. Uh, did you change the lock? Is asked, and she says, I did sometimes. And then we get a bitter taste in the mouth as the, the lips kind of pull back. You get a little bit of lip compression, but we see these pull back. It's because this area gets activated the same way that if you put what we call an alkaloid in your mouth, something that is bitter tasting, like hops or something like that, or, or um, you know, aloes or something like that, you get that um, astringent taste. So it's different from um, this here, those lips pushing forward, which is almost a sour taste of pushing something out of your mouth. This is to stop stuff going. It's already got to the back here where it's bitter and you've now got to stop it going down. We get this bitter taste and slight narrowing of the eyes as well. And I would say that is targeted aggression happening there, targeted aggression. So that there's my force multiplier for you, Chase, on I think one of her ways of potentially reacting to being not in control of stuff is aggression. And I think she's not in control of the questioning here. So is it bitterness and aggression around, uh, I did sometimes, yeah, I, I, I changed the locks? No, I think it's to the question being asked. It's to the question being asked. She doesn't like being asked questions she's not necessarily ready for because she says, I did sometimes. So why not just say, yeah, I did or I didn't. If you are ready for it, you would, and you've been coached on it, you'd go, I don't recall, or you'd say yes, or you'd say no, because you know, you know what your answer should be. She doesn't know what her answer should be on this. She's out of control and we see this aggression. And it's out of baseline for her. Her baseline is lots of stuff happens, but we haven't seen very much these narrowing of the eyes towards targeting so much. And so, and I think that's a target on the on the lawyer there. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, taking everything you guys said into consideration and what I'm gonna talk about is just everything other than that has stayed the same. The fairly uh, innocuous Concern and arouse still there off and on, blah, 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 same stuff. Now, you indicated that Mr. Torres would use your phone to look at pornography. Correct. Were there ever any points in times when it was you that was used looking at pornography? Um, if I was, it was to go back and look to see. Did you ever threaten to get Mr. Torres arrested if he did not do what you wanted him to do? I wouldn't say threaten. Okay. Well, were there ever points in times where you would like him to call you or return a call, and if he didn't do that, um, you would threaten to get him arrested? It depends on if he had my keys or something that I needed from him. Okay. 
And it was your townhouse, correct? Mine, yes. Flash ours. Well, you, when did you get them off the lease? Uh, I, I'm not sure what um, year it was, but I don't think he was actually removed from the lease. Okay. I think he was made a different type of tenant. And did you change the locks so that he couldn't get back in at the points in times when you picked him out? I did, sometimes. Okay. And then would you leave the key in the hiding spot that he was aware of? There were multiple hiding places. Okay. On any of the 911 calls, did you ever mention that Mr. Torres was aware of where you kept your keys and that's how he got back into the house? I didn't know I needed to. Okay. He would never break into my home. All right, and it's your testimony that you did not push him down the stairs, correct? Yes. And, in fact, it was him that dragged you down the stairs the night before, correct? Yes. Now, by dragged, were, did you leave your feet? Yes. And did you get scrapes on your knees or anywhere from the carpet? I'm not sure. I don't... Did you get any injuries, like bruises or abrasions or scrapes? Um, I was missing a... A lot of my hair, yes, that was on the stairwell. Okay. And you agree that you were photographed on February 24th when the police came out, correct? The day of the incident? Well, the <coughs> afternoon after the incident. We're not sure when he passed. Yes. Some of those photographs showed ashtrays inside your house. Were you, I thought you said you guys couldn't smoke inside your house. We couldn't. But you did, right? Sometimes, yes. And you agree you would go to the hospital and tell them things that were not true, correct? Yes. There were times where you would go to the hospital and leave without getting treatment, correct? Yes. And is it fair to say that you often had alcohol in your system when you were going to the hospital, correct? Sometimes. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Um, okay. Uh, did you push him down the stairs? Uh, on that, we get, on her answer to that, we get contempt. We get a lip pucker on that. So that's lips right forward. Uh, often we'll think that's coming from literally pushing food out of your mouth. Like a lot of our nonverbal responses are based in the primal area of just keeping yourself alive, eating, getting bad food out your mouth. You've always got to think about what is the function? What's the what's the primal function of this gesture to work out what would it originally have been about? Therefore, what might its its meaning be? So the lip pucker, other than, you know, it's a, it's a kiss. Actually, the kissing originally, originally comes from the primal thing of pre-digesting food, chew, the mother chewing it up and then passing it pre-digested in many ways to the infant. You know, because back in the day, <laughs> you didn't have, well, you didn't have blenders back in the day. So somebody has to pre-chew the food and then pass it over to an Moment. infant. That's where the kiss comes from. So we get contempt and a pucker and a blink rate goes up to, I was, I was reading 180 per minute there, which is just, and maybe it's too many. Maybe that's just ridiculous. But that's what I got out of it. So there's some stress around that one. Did not I did not push him down the stairs. There's a lot of stress around that one there. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, her mouth is open briefly, which harkens back to uh, when we all were birds and we would open our mouth for regurgitated food. Uh, I made all of that up. <laughs> uh, Mark was likely extremely accurate, yeah, and I just true. made all that up. True. But I agree. Uh, when she says it was him or the attorney says it was him that dragged you down the stairs that the night before blink rate goes to nothing. She says, yes, head nod twice. Eyes are open. And the first one, she closes her eyes as she says, yes, and no changes on the face. That's a sales pitch. That is a victim sales pitch. 
And she says she was missing a wad of hair. It wasn't pulled out. It wasn't yanked out. It didn't get jerked out of my head as I was getting dragged down the stairs. Just missing. If you get into a fire, you're going to say, yeah, and now I'm missing a tooth. Or were you going to say, I got a tooth knocked out? Big difference. There's no action in the statement. There's no perpetrator in the statement. And going to the hospital intoxicated and potentially misrepresenting the facts to me indicates a pattern of seeking validation or sympathy while avoiding accountability there. And emphasizing these details like missing hair and carpet burns might elicit some sympathy or imply a history of conflict where she sees herself as the one that gets harmed all the time. And this framing can usually be used to justify later actions in her head, uh, just building a case that she was treated badly or is under a lot of stress. She just can't say it out loud. It would be silly if she said it out loud. She has to subtly communicate the feeling of it instead, which is what's happening here. Uh, and maybe what's happened in the times in the hospital. So the hospital trips might have been a way to gain force multipliers in the police. If I go there enough, it gets me another layer of evidence for the next time I decide to call the police when he doesn't do exactly what I want him to do. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, it is a force, force multiplier, 100% agree. And I think it's a great example of like a neighbor who uses an HOA against their neighbor. Or if you're the kind of person who wants to use the government against your friends because you disagree with them, you're this kind of person, in my opinion. Yeah, Mark, I think the word, I think there's actually a word for chewing food for those who have no teeth, and it's mumming, if I recall my history correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Being a history fan. I think it's correct. Somebody correct me and tell me if I'm wrong down the bottom. You can't just but, make stuff up. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> the, if you look, there's confrontational woman from the, remember when we first saw her, we were like, she was in a pissing contest with two cops. There was not an interrogation. It was a, no, you aren't. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. No, you aren't. We're seeing that person here. Mark, in the last video, you said she turned her attention to this guy. She clearly turns her attention to this guy. She's back to that same confrontational woman who's like, it's horrific. I was drinking. And you see her eyes widen. Her voice tone changes. She's demonstrative. She's not front of the mouth again. Now she's moved back to telling. We This is exactly like that day. And then she actually uses the words, the day of the incident. The day of the incident. You mean when this guy died? that you supposedly were in a relationship with. Chase, you always talk about severity softening. You don't get much soft, softer than the day of the incident. The day a guy died in a suitcase that you zipped up. <laughs> I love, then she does more of this parsing words. Well, we couldn't smoke in the, in the apartment, but we did sometimes. Her blink rate and her respiration are keys to this stuff. You can tell when she's in a bind, when she has lost control, because that blink rate goes up, that respiration goes up, and she goes to those short answers Yes, no, did not, didn't, those kinds of things. Scott, what do you got? All right. This is the first big change we've seen in her facial movements that, that have been going on. I think you talked about it, Mark. We've seen the pursed lips and what looks like or, or could be disdain. But we're seeing lips pursed to the side. And usually when that happens, that person sees an alternate outcome or alternative outcome to what's being presented, in other words. So I think when as the... Um, Attorney is, is telling her what the situation is and before he, as he's framing the question. She sees that, and that's why they go to the side, because she sees an, al an alternate uh, outcome as to what he's presenting there. So we see eye blocking. You know, for, for I think it's the first time we've seen eye blocking up to this point, and, uh, which is interesting because these are things that should be, the whole thing should have been bothering her, but these are specifics that are, for some reason, bothering her. So and I think that, was, that might be because she's being deceptive at these points. And some of these things, there's no reason whatsoever for her to be deceptive about anything in this except for to guard her ego. That's the only, I mean, she's, she's in my opinion, she's, she's had it. She's done for in this. So, but we can, if we compare her baseline to what's going on now, there's nothing really has changed. Nothing's happened except for that, those one couple of movements that, that we just, that just went over. Now, on the ashtray question, I don't think there's any, any deception there. And those last three questions about the hospital, I'm not seeing deception there. She just, it's, she's not relaxed, but nothing's changed. Nothing is, has popped out of that uh, baseline. So for me, those, they, those look non-deceptive up to now. So that's all I got on that one. 
All right, it's your testimony that you did not push him down the stairs, correct? Yes. And, in fact, it was him that dragged you down the stairs the night before, correct? Yes. Now, by dragged, were, did you leave your feet? Yes. And did you get scrapes on your knees or anywhere from the carpet? I'm not sure. I don't... Did you get any injuries, like bruises or abrasions or scrapes? Um, I was missing a... A lot of my hair, yes, that was on the stairwell. Okay. And you agree that you were photographed on February 24th when the police came out, correct? The day of the incident? Well, <coughs> the afternoon after the incident. We're not sure when he passed. Yes. Some of those photographs showed ashtrays inside your house. Were you, I thought you said you guys couldn't smoke inside your house. We couldn't. But you did, right? Sometimes, yes. And you agree you would go to the hospital and tell them things that were not true, correct? Yes. There were times where you would go to the hospital and leave without getting treatment, correct? Yes. And is it fair to say that you often had alcohol in your system when you were going to the hospital, correct? Sometimes. So it ends in hide and seek after arts and puzzles, correct? Yes. He says, tag, you're it, but you run and go upstairs and hide, right? Yes. So does that mean he's it and he's supposed to come find you? No. Okay. Just... So you both hide? No. Okay. How does this work? Okay. I, I don't know how to tell you. I, okay. I was it and I, I went and hid. I mean... My understanding of the rules of hide and seek is one person will be it, cover his or her eyes and count to like 20 and then go find the person that's hiding. Is that your familiarity with the rules too or do you guys have house rules? Cool. I understand how the okay. you know, hide and seek works. So explain to me what was your expectation. You go up to the shower. Were you expecting him to come find you? I was. Okay. And after a while he did not come find you. And that's when you return downstairs. Correct. And because of the way your townhouse is set up, you can kind of see over where the suitcase is and that he's trying to hide in there, but it's not successfully hidden just yet. I mean, yes, you have to come down a good ways in order to be able to Right, do that. right. But you saw, you, you testified those before you got to the bottom. Yes. All right. And then you come over there and thinking that it's funny, you zip him shut, correct? Yes, we both thought it was funny. Okay. Uh, All right, Greg, what do you got? This is a real short one for me, but concerning the brow, again, we see that little wrinkle in her brow as she's attacked for how hide-and-seek actually plays out. But watch her respiration go through the roof when she gets to the details and when they ask her about seeing him in the suitcase. I wonder around there why that specific spike and that poker pretty hard. And then she uses team pronouns or sharing the blame by doing a pronoun shift, and it's we. We were doing that. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, there are, in my mind, two strong reasons why you would be getting um, it wrong how to play a game, okay? It's the hide-and-seek game, and uh, she says that um, tag your it, tag your it, and then she goes and hides. The lawyer says, well, that's the wrong way around. You know, if you tag your it, then they become the seeker, you become the hider. She says, no, 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 that's not the way that that it is. Well, so two reasons, potential reasons for that. One would be um, the antisocial reason. We learn games as kids because it's a non-lethal way to understand how to play the game of, of relationships. And so games have strong rules to them, simple rules, but you apply by the rules because you have to learn to apply yourself to the rules because you have to learn what happens if you break the rules. You've got to learn the prizes and punishment of breaking the rules. So is she say, is she reversing the roles there because she has an antisocial personality disorder. Well, she may have that, but I don't think that's why she's reversing the rules. She's reversing the rules here because she's telling a big lie. And when you tell lies, <laughs> you sometimes forget 
the rules of the games because you never played the game. She says there was puzzling and crafting and drinking and then games. I don't think there was any puzzling or crafting. I think there was probably some drinking. I think that's true. Some throwing down the stairs. Yeah, yeah. and there were some <laughs> shenanigans of some sort going on. But I don't think hide and seek was any part of it. It's part of her big strategy of going, hey, we were playing a game. And if that were true, she'd be able to apply ourselves to the rules of that game and go, look, tag, you're it. And so I became the bunny and that person became the dog. And like, you know, we we understand the rules of the, of the chase around that and the hiding and the seeking. It's got it all wrong. Look, there may be some some antisocial personality disorder in there. And we would see that of somebody purposely messing up the rules of the game in spite of of normal society. But here, just a big fat liar uh, dealing with the situation in my personal point of view here. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Let's talk about her framing of the incident. She frames the whole incident as a game of uh, hide and seek. And this is possibly what's called a regressive strategy in trial consulting using this childlike language to paint herself as innocent and naive, talking about arts and puzzles, calling it just a game, evoking the sense of harmless uh, playfulness that downplays the seriousness of what really happened. So this childlike framing shifts her into a passive, almost dependent role, like she was just swept up in fun without thinking of any consequences. So she's inviting the jury to see her as less responsible, just like a child who couldn't predict any danger that was coming up. And this setup can very subtly and effectively tap into a jury's protective instincts and make them more inclined to see her as somebody who made a mistake instead of a calculated decision. Uh, the simple, familiar language of play and hiding distances, distances her from accountability uh, like she's lacked the adult foresight to understand any of that risk. So she's leaning into this regressive narrative. She positions herself not as some cold, calculating adult, but as this playful kid. It's not a big deal. It's just a kid. We were arts and crafts day and then hide and seek. And we had recess right after that. So it's encouraging the jury to forgive this perceived lack of awareness. So a lot of our childhood behavioral patterns, especially the ones that helped us get out of trouble, stay with us into adulthood without us noticing. So when we're young, behaviors like playing innocent, downplaying responsibility, evoking sympathy in somebody can be extremely effective to avoid punishment or get people to step in. I can recruit people with that behavior as a protector. So these tactics get ingrained in instinctual in us. So when you see these, you're able to look into someone's past, but you're also able to see how they're going to navigate the future stress. I did an entire training on this on my YouTube channel where I talked about childhood patterns of behavior. They are so important to be able to spot. What are the patterns that I'm seeing in this person when they deal with stress and pressure, as Mark would say? Scott, what do you got? You and Mark... Well, I guess Greg, Greg didn't nail it quite on where I was. I have just totally wiped out my paragraph. So I'll have nothing on that one. Thanks, guys. Pleasure. Wait a minute. You know how everybody always thinks that I'm that we're fussing on here? That made yeah. I looked at me when I did that. It did look like I was mad, didn't it? Yeah, but were you keep mad? It, keep it in. No. Well, there you go. There you well, go. I'll keep that in. Yeah. So it ends in hide and seek after arts and puzzles, correct? He says, tag, you're it, but you run and go upstairs and hide, right? Yes. So does that mean he's it and he's supposed to come find you? No. Okay. Just... So you both hide? No. Okay. How does this work? I, I don't know how to tell you. I, okay. I was it and I, I went and hid. I mean... My understanding of the rules of hide and seek is one person will be it, cover his or her eyes and count to like 20 and then go find the person that's hiding. Is that your familiarity with the rules too or do you guys have house rules? Cool. I understand how the, okay. the hide and seek works. So, 
Explain to me what was your expectation. You go up to the shower. Were you expecting him to come find you? I was. Okay. And after a while, he did not come find you. Yes. And that's when you returned downstairs. Right. And because of the way your townhouse is set up, you can kind of see over where the suitcase is and that he's trying to hide in there, but it's not successfully hidden just yet. I mean, yes, you have to come down a good ways in order to be able to Right, do that. right. But you saw him, you, you testified those before you got to the bottom. Yes. All right. And then you come over there, and thinking that it's funny, you zip him shut, correct? Yes, we both thought it was funny. Okay. And the defendant, uh, stand down. Can we see how it was that the two zipper parts were positioned when you say that Mr. Torres was able to get his hand out? If you want me to do it, I'm fine. I'll take your direction. Um, from what I remember, this is how the suitcase, this is how the suitcase works. This was up here. <clears throat> this was not this hard either. This one, like here. Okay. Right here. About right there, ma'am? Sure. Okay. I assume this one was much closer. It's not over there? Where did you, where did you leave? You asked me where I zipped it. When, when you say that it was zipped shut, Show us. Are you talking about how I zipped it or? When you're done yeah, zipping it shut and he's inside of it, where are the zipper components? Right here. Just tell me where it's at. I mean, it was the corner. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. You can return to your seat. Okay, I'll go first on this one. Um, if somebody that I loved died in a bag like that and they wanted me to touch it, I don't think I would be into touching it. I don't think I would be wanting to go near it. I don't think it, it would be tough to look at it. I don't think I want to have anything to do with it. And he actually says, you don't have to touch it. I'll do it if you don't want to do it. She just dismisses that. Doesn't even address that part, really. You know, she goes in, puts her hands all over it, in it, tries to pull on it, turns it around, moves it around. No problem with getting right up next to it. This is where I was trying to decide if we're dealing with a psychopath or not. Here's why I think we're not. If we're dealing with what is known as a sociopath, it's because she's not trying to ingratiate herself with anyone. She's not got that personality type to try to make you like her. She's not being nice or anything like that. I think she's just been raised as, as the quote unquote sociopath is to where she, her feelings as a child weren't addressed. I don't think she had anybody saying to her, Hey, listen, you know, don't do that. You know but, what my mentor called that? Mm -mm. Uh, they don't make eye contact with waiters. That's that's how he described that person. Like they don't they don't interact. They transact only. They'll just yeah. throw it out. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 that makes sense. That makes sense. And you can always tell about a person who doesn't actually talk to the waiter or waitress or the the uh, uh, barista or whatever if they don't lock with them. I make a lot of decisions about people seeing that. That's really that that's really a that's a big deal. But if I love somebody and they would been in that bag. Or that bag had probably even been there. I wouldn't want to get near it, touch it, do anything. And she has no problem whatsoever touching it. So I think what we're seeing here is a person who has been disassociated from having the empathetic feelings. 
similar to a psychopath because a psychopath doesn't have the equipment to let them have those empathetic feelings to create those. So I think that's why she doesn't have a problem feeling it, touching it, dismissing it, not staring at it. We don't see any emotion. When that comes up, we don't see any sadness. We don't see anything that lets us know that that suitcase bothers her, even though she beat, you know, I'm under the impression she beat the guy to death or helped him pass uh, by beating him when he's in the dang bag. And she has no problem. What? I don't know if there's any evidence she beat him while he was in the bag. Let's oh, I thought, with that. Okay, yeah. I take that part back. I was under the impression that that's what that guy brought up earlier that, that the attorney had said. Well, he's he implied it, but I haven't heard him say. And she does hit, she even volunteers to go and say, I'll show you how I did it. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, I don't know that there's I'll, any evidence that that's what killed him. Yeah. Okay, I'll take that back then since we don't have the evidence. I, I, I recall that, or I'll take it back. But so I don't think we're dealing with a psychopath here. I think it's a soci she's a sociopath. And I, I think those are the reasons why. So that that bothered me all the way up to that point. So I think that's uh that's what we're saying, because we don't see any, emo any emotion at all, not even a little bit when it comes to that bag. Uh Chase, what do you got? Mark brought this up earlier. Uh I want to talk about her outfit, if y'all <laughs> will allow me to do that. Uh, as an attorney or as a trial consultant, uh, I'm not an attorney, uh, I would never choose all black or all darks uh, for a woman on trial. With her appearance, I would go through every single episode of The Office and make her subconsciously resemble Pam Beasley to that jury. It would be easy to do with that haircut and her body type. They wouldn't know why, but they would start to see that and they'd feel a certain way about her. I wrote an entire chapter uh, of these tricks. There's like, a, I think, 71 of them uh, in my new book. And it, this is definitely one that is really powerful. If you can harness it, we go into those uh, for jury psychology and uh, anybody's psychology can be manipulated that way, really. But these demonstrations can be very powerful, even though they seem stupid. This with the suitcase is what I'm talking about. It seems stupid. Why are they like, why is this relevant? Why is this important? Demonstrations create vivid, memorable moments that can impact jurors emotionally. So watching a suspect zip up a suitcase that somebody later died in brings emotional intensity to the abstract facts of the case. All these random facts, now I see it happen. And that's kind of why we we might be seeing that here. So bringing this mundane behavior of zipping the suitcase in front of the jury makes them visualize it and it makes it visceral. It underscores these darker implications of what really took place. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, uh, I think everybody's spot on here. Scott, let me pick up further on this empathy piece, because I think you're spot on there. And there are many types of empathy. I'm just going to describe two of the types of empathy to you uh, and, and the empathy that I had with that suitcase piece. I had what what we call cognitive empathy with, with it. I think that's what you're talking about there, Scott, which is I, I understand the kind of feeling that somebody could have, you know, if they had emotional empathy for, you know, somebody dying in a bag that they're now touching. I think if I were there on the spot, I might get a sense of that emotional empathy. But right now, very detached from it, I can only have cognitive empathy, which which is me going, oh, that would be very odd. That would, could be a very odd feeling. But I'm not feeling the feeling myself. Uh, for some of you there, you might be watching that and you might actually feel something of a feeling. That would be you're having an emotional empathy, but I don't have that emotional empathy. And so... Because I'm not having emotional empathy for it, but I am em empathetic, I have cognitive empathy. Both are very important. The way, the way, the place my mind goes, and, you know, somebody died in that bag, but because I'm only having cognitive empathy for it, where else my mind can go? And because most of this week I've spent more time in the air than I have on the ground, I go, this is a lesson in quality luggage because I just can't get over how stiff that zip is. And I can't get over my own emotional empathy of the frustration of having to kind of, the, the zip won't close. Because when I'm, you know, packing up, which I'm doing on a regular basis, I'm about speed. And I need a very 
slick zip. And you only really get that with very high quality luggage. I mean, that's what you're paying for. That is what you are paying for. And so my emotional empathy is with the frustration of that zip. And my cognitive empathy is within, you know, wouldn't that feel odd if you had actually killed somebody or you knew the person and you were trying to do that? So uh, the other thing, the other thing, again, because I'm in cognitive empathy and not emotional empathy, is I can't get over how this now just looks like an auction house. And we've got people dressed in suits with white gloves. And they now look like they're handling some piece of conceptual art together. That's and what so, it looks like. Yeah, somebody's going to go, okay, we Antiques start the bidding on, on, on suitcase yeah, on the floor at a million dollars. A million dollars. Do I have a million dollars? Million dollars. Million million dollars, 100. Million dollars, 100. On the phones. On the phones, million dollars, 200. And they get up to the five. Five million. Five million for suitcase on the floor. Going once, going twice. Five million. Five million to the Saudis. And and there we go. Can't get over that. Anyway, hope that was interesting on emotional and cognitive empathy. Greg, what do you got on this one? You know what I can't get over? Somebody stupid enough to get up and reenact a crime. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you thinking? If you have an attorney, they have zero empathy for you at this point, and they're saying, hey, yeah, get up. Go over there and show them exactly what you did. And by the way, since the zipper is sticky and you were drunk, that means you went through a little extra effort to get it to happen. <laughs> I mean, what the hell are you thinking? What are you thinking when that happens? By the way, if you ever go on trial and you fire all your attorneys and they ask you to get up and reenact a crime, don't do it. Just don't do it. Just say, hey, there's video of how it looked. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I will admit that I zipped it here. I'm not getting up and doing that. That's just stupid. On unless, top of that. Unless but, you are Gwyneth Paltrow and you're the most comfortable person <laughs> in the room and you can make them feel like dipshits for doing yeah that. because you didn't commit a crime right. yeah correct. in this case you've admitted i committed a crime you're gonna get up and reenact it and you're gonna show how you fasten this guy in there and then later say you want me to demonstrate how i hit him with a bat when he was in there i mean what the hell are you thinking this is a clear somebody who thinks they're smarter than they are and they have a message they're going to deliver they're reinforcing everything we thought in the very beginning the first video she's getting up and doing exactly that and to your point scott a guy died in here, not just a guy, somebody she knew. And if it was an accident, we should see the same behavior we saw when she saw that very first cop. You remember the very first cop all the way back at the beginning it was all that apprehensive and panicked and all that. That act is gone. That is gone. So now somewhere she's got to get back in the act. I don't know how that works. I think this is what goes on when you had a strategy two years ago and you chase back to the organism does what made the organism successful. This person's gotten away with this stuff for two years or thinks she has. Scott, back to your point of she has not thought of what she's not thought of. And she stands up and does this in front of them. This is, I cannot imagine being sitting in the front row and not thinking, wow, that's pretty creepy. That's pretty creepy. That probably weighed in heavily. What a dumb move. That's all I got. And Greg, right, do you me, know if this is the actual? Is this the actual case? Is that why they've got the white gloves? It's not a reproduction. Yeah, it's not a. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, they go into details. The parts you guys didn't see because I clipped the videos. Of course, is they say there was not a paper clip on here, and they're very. Her, a lawyer tries to protect her a couple of times and tries to get her out of it, and says, "Hey, there was not a paper clip on there. There's a paper clip now, so she can't show you exactly how she would have done it." I, I object. There's video of where this thing was zipped. What, what happened to all that? Right. This is a. This is ugly. This is ugly. Yeah. Well, let me bring up one thing about marking the luggage thing. Uh, usually when you see, let's talk about the way Mark looks here and the way he looks in, when when he's not in here. You see him out somewhere, for like for doing a show or something. We're all together. We go out. Or if you travel with him, because we, we have. When you see Mark on here, he, comparatively, he looks like a homeless person. <laughs> with what he, when it, what he wears on here to what he wears outside, you know, out in the, out in the wild. So... I don't know, and I've seen his luggage, and I can't, I don't know how he puts all that stuff in there. And we talked about that one time on a plane, Mark, me, when mm -hmm. me and you were going to wherever we were going. And I still don't, it, uh, my mind is blown how you can fit all that stuff in your bag, all those different suits where it looks like you just walked out of some Italian, whatever it was, you know, suit maker, and they're all different. I don't know, I don't know how that's, I don't know how you pull that off. So I understand your concern and your focus on on With the, the luggage, luggage here yeah 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 thank, thank so it's, you for your, your understanding and empathy on that you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think she did when she was shopping for luggage hey um do you have anything big enough to fit my boy right, right. yeah let's go luggage shopping i, mean, I would have gone with bigger it's a tiny 
case, isn't it? It's like, but tell tell him how much he weighed, Greg. 103, 103. Oh, he's tiny. Yeah. A little bit. She fell. weighed 90 something. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 So he's half me. Less than, yeah, half me. Yeah, less than half me. <laughs> <laughs> Can we see how it was that the two zipper parts were positioned when you say that Mr. Torres was able to get his hand out? If you want me to do it, I'm fine. I'll take your direction. Um, from what I remember, this is how the suitcase, this is how the suitcase works. This was up here. <clears throat> this was not this hard either. This one, like here. Okay. Right here. About right there, ma'am? Sure. Okay. I assume this one was much closer. It's not over there? Where did you, where did you leave? You asked me where I zipped it. When, when you say that it was zipped shut, Show us. Are you talking about how I zipped it or? When you're done yeah, zipping it shut and he's inside of it, where are the zipper components? Just tell me what it's at. Did you ever change the position of those zippers once once you put it in that position? I did not. And so once he was zipped into there, there's some amount of time, but you don't remember specifically before you start taking the two minute video, correct? Yes. And then that's when you say what you say, and that's when he says what he says, we've all heard it, correct? Yes. And then between there and that second video of the 22 seconds length, it's at this point where he's beginning to get angry, and then that's when you take the baseball bat that's in evidence, and your testimony is start poking him with the end of it. Did you say this was the second video? Between the two videos. That's that's when you started hitting with the bat because he was getting angry and trying to escape, correct? Right, I was not hitting him, I was, yes. Okay. Did you ever hit him with the bat while he was outside of the suitcase? No. So, each time that he is hit with the bat, it's through this suitcase. And that's what leaves the marks on him because you didn't hit him with the bat outside the suitcase, correct? Yes, if you'd like me to demonstrate. No, that's okay. The suitcase will speak for itself. Um, and then you take the second video and you go upstairs and go to bed, correct? I apparently went upstairs and I used the phone to make a phone call. Okay. And then I fell asleep. All right. And at the point in time when you left and went upstairs, he was still inside the suitcase, correct? Was he still asking for you and calling your name? Not that I can recall. Did you say shh to him again? I don't remember. Did you tell him that this was his problem and it's on you again? I don't remember. Did you do anything to help him escape from the predicament that you zipped him up in? No. No other questions. 
Any redirect examination? All right, uh, Chase, what do you got? Greg's going to tell you about non-contractions here, or somebody will, uh, about the zipper thing. But the, the prosecutor brushes over what was said in her video. He could have used that opportunity to briefly go through what was said to reestablish it in the jury's mind. Right after they witnessed her zipping up the suitcase, he just brushes over what she said during that video. That would have been the most powerful time to do that recap. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I I just assume that those people in the jury are humans and they have a brain. That I do know about. I don't know why they didn't have her demonstrate with the baseball bat. If I was the prosecutor there, I'd be like, yeah, come on down. grab, Bring, bring the bat out. Exhibit batter two, up. Yeah. <laughs> 29. I think this is the moment when she realizes how the case is going to go. And you can see it on her face. You can see resignation on her face. Scott, what do you got? All right. Now her mouth movements and her and her eye blinking, these are almost in they're almost in unison here. Go back and watch this because it is bizarre. This goes back to what I was saying earlier. This really does look like a time lapse. A video here the way the way this is happening so quickly it's it's i've not seen this before like this maybe you guys have i've never seen this and her breath rate is the same as a person who's being held at gunpoint or there something horrible is about to happen you can see him there was a point where you freeze and then as you go through it the, the your breathing starts getting really really fast really really quick and that's what it looks like here i think she's for some reason in a panic at this point we uh, did from, see it once with who Briefly. With Stephanie Lazarus. What was she doing? Right when they were asking her about the car. Uh, right before yeah. she started doing that. All right. That was weird, man. Yeah, Good call. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but, so it looks like she's sort of in a panic here. And I, and these are the, the most lengthy answers she she's had so far. So this section here is a big deal to her. Of course, it's sort of wrapping up this section of it, but that's a really big deal to her right there. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, let me, Chase, I'll take the non-contraction uh, piece. Sorry if it was your only point, Greg. <laughs> I'm sure no, it isn't. I I'm frankly one. sure it isn't. Um, For me, uh, yeah. Did you ever change the position of the zippers? Now, my guess is, that's, that's the question. My guess is that's important because if she can say, hey, there was an air gap there, all the time, it would suggest he should be able to breathe and therefore it might be a medical condition that that caused him to die, not that she had cut off air and essentially suffocated um, him. Whether it was knowingly or unknowingly, wittingly or unwittingly, it, it would make a big difference, which is what you've said earlier on the videos that we did first off months and months or years ago, that what she thinks is an alibi, two years ago, is it? Wow. Um, what she thinks is an alibi or a way out of this isn't necessarily what the courts will think. But anyway, my guess is this air gap uh, is, is important, that she didn't go back, close it up more, or, she, or maybe she opened it up afterwards before she calls in the authorities. Anyway, did you ever change the position of the zipper? I did not. A better answer would be, no, or even yes, or I didn't. That she's giving it three syllables, I did not, which is non-contracted. Contracted would be I didn't, or even a simple yes or no would be certainly less syllables than I did not, would suggest to us in this circumstance, given all the other cluster of information that we have, that she is most likely being deceptive in this particular moment. Most likely, does it mean she's being deceptive? Absolutely. No, that would be nonsense. But is it more likely? Yeah, we would gamble more likely. Would we lose that gamble now and again? Yes, of course we would. Would we win it more times than we lose it? Yes, we would win it more times than we'd ever lose it. Greg, what do you think? I'm gonna compound on the I did not it's interesting because she forgets to or she forgets to remember to forget if you go back to my original thing about what she should remember. She shouldn't remember all those details about I did not. She she forgot all these other details that were important. She should say I don't remember. It doesn't tie together with everything she said to now. So her whole strategy is coming apart and that's what we're starting to see. She's answering questions when she shouldn't. 
I'm also going to just give you one other big point, and then I'll tell you I know this is hitting her. The other big point is this. She conditioned whether she hid keys. She conditioned when she smoked in the house. She conditioned uh, whether she would threaten to call the police on him. She doesn't condition at all the baseball bat issue. And chase some with you. I would have said, batter up. Come on, get up here and hit that bag. If she had, if we think that she is conditioning everything else and she doesn't condition hitting him with the bat, it's likely that she hit him pretty damn hard. She's not doing any kind of shadowing or any of that kind of stuff. I'd be interested in knowing more. You know, those of you who know this case, because people have been watching it for months and years, tell us down in the in the comments about what the conditions of his body were. Did she beat him up with a bat and that kind of stuff? Because I don't know all the details. We watch the videos and we give you from there. So let, this is, once again, her arrogance at knowing what to say when she says, would you like me to demonstrate? Well, no attorney is going to say, yeah, get up there and hit the bag like there's a guy in it after you just zipped him up in it. That's a really dumb move. Watch the concern in her blink rate, the concern in her forehead, her blink rate go through the roof, that, that furrow there, and then she does some serious mouth grooming. The best part of this whole thing is when she's sitting silently and she starts to bury her a little bit and then she does all that mouth movement and all that stuff and it rises. All those things we've been watching go through the roof and we see a lot of it. So they've gotten her. She's on the mat now. And I got this chair. It's supposed to be comfortable and it's supposed to help your posture and your back. Yeah. It's the, my back hurts. It's the most uncomfortable thing I've ever had. It's today's the first time using it. It's like a saddle. Um, you ever <laughs> does it make a noise? Does it go or something? There's no. something in your background when you talk. Saddle. Look at this. It's one of those I ones. Oh, yeah. I, you, yeah. I used to have. Oh, okay. Yep. I used to have one of the ones which you kneel on at the same oh, time. Oh, those are brutal on the knees. It was yeah. brutal on your knees. It was actually quite good for my back, but it was brutal on my knees. Yeah. Chase, you know, it's funny. In a video one last week or week before, it was last week because I had to keep turning because I was in a really bad place last week and trying to get through two hours of whatever we were doing. People were like, you disrespect Chase. You're moving when he's talking. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I, and I, I wrote in the notes was bad read, lower back pain. Wow. <laughs> so there's context, right? Yeah, that's context. Yeah. Damn. Where'd you yeah. get it? Send it back, Chase. Yeah, I'm still in the Amazon return window. So beautiful. She'll there be heading know. back. Beautiful. Uh, that's too bad. Uh, your your post uh, post lady will be zipping up the drive to you for a bottle of water. For a bottle of water. Hey, so Mark, <laughs> what do you guys call the mailman in in Canada? Uh, well, yeah, I, I I still call it the you know the postman, um, but because that's what we had back in back in England. But yeah, I'm getting more used to. I mean, I've been here a while now, but yeah, it's called the mail here. Yeah, male person, male man, male lady, male woman. When you live like the we male. do, it's a rural carrier. I think we generalize it now to just the male. It's the male. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Did you ever change the position of those zippers once, once you put it in that position? I did not. So once he was zipped into there, there's some amount of time, but you don't remember specifically before you start taking the two minute video, correct? Yes. And then that's when you say what you say, and that's when he says what he says, we've all heard it, correct? Yes. And then between there and that second video of the 22 seconds length, it's at this point where he's beginning to get angry. And then that's when you take the baseball bat that's in evidence and your testimony is to start poking him with the end of it. Did you say this was the second video? Between the two videos. That's that's when you started hitting with the bat because he was getting angry and trying to escape, correct? Right. I was not hitting him. I was, yes. Okay. Did you ever hit him with the bat while he was outside of the suitcase? No. So each time that he is hit with the bat, it's through this suitcase. And that's what leaves the marks on him because you didn't hit him with the bat outside the suitcase, correct? Yes, if you'd like to demonstrate. No, that's okay. The suitcase will speak for itself. Um, and then you take the second video and you go upstairs and go to bed, correct? I apparently did. 
apparently went upstairs and I used the phone to make a phone call. Okay. And then I fell asleep. All right. And at the point in time when you left and went upstairs, he was still inside the suitcase, correct? Correct. Was he still asking for you and calling your name? Not that I can recall. Did you say shh to him again? I don't remember. Did you tell him that this was his problem and it's on you again? I don't remember. Did you do anything to help him escape from the predicament that you zipped him up in? No. No other questions. Any redirect examination? All right, well, we've taken a look at the videos, and we've told you pretty much what we've seen so far. But, Mark, how are things looking to you as a whole so far? Uh, look, you know, the where, the place I get obsessed is obviously with myself. And so, you know, uh, uh, Greg, you're always saying a fish um, uh, uh, like what it tastes of what it, what it swims in. Yeah. And I swim a lot in auction houses uh, and, <laughs> and, and aircraft. And so I'm just getting over the fact that I watched that video of somebody zipping up a suitcase that somebody died in, and my bias is towards auction houses and luggage. And that suggests to me that we always have to view videos going, whether I know it or not, and you're best off knowing it, I'm going to have a viewpoint on this, which is really based on who I am, where I live. And of course, you can suspend those judgments and you can get out of that. And we as a group are always trying to do that. And we're trying to promote how you do that, but always with the best will in the world. You've got to know that's going on. And the best way to know it's going on is to own up to it and go, ah, here's what I'm seeing here. And that's a bias. That's about my own world. It was just very stark for me there. And it, and it tells me something about me, which is actually probably the most important reason to watch these is hopefully these tell you more about you than they do about anybody else, we would hope. Chase, what are you seeing? Yep, I totally agree. This is a, just a horrible case overall. The, the first time I watched that video with the suitcase, that shook me pretty hard. It's soulless and heart-wrenching, that, that that's a phrase. There's definitely a huge lesson here when it comes to profiling. Uh, when you're observing somebody under stress, watch for selective shifts between roles. That's the biggest thing there, roles. Like uh, her toggling from naive to competent or distressed. It was kind of between those three things. So these switches can reveal a lot of underlying discomfort with the truth. And the number one biggest thing I can leave you with is when you see patterns in response to stress and pressure, you'll be able to see what somebody did as a kid to keep them safe, earn them recognition, or get them back into a social circle. Greg? I don't think we've ever had a video in our entire time that demonstrates the organism does what made the organism successful as well as this one. This was easy to call how she was going to behave in court based on how she treated the first responders who came to see her and then further went into an interrogation room and got into an argument where she, she thought she could talk her way out of whatever was going on. Whether she's guilty or innocent doesn't matter. She demonstrated how she was going to behave, and then we watched it play out in this set of videos. And, Mark, I don't think that's because it's what I swim in to believe that people do that. I think this is one of those cases where I would not have been able to pay her to illustrate this more effectively. Scott, what do you got? I think this has been a great example of seeing someone who is probably thought to be a psychopath because they, there are a lot of behaviors in there that would suggest that, but sh seeing why they aren't and why they are more of a sociopath so to speak. So from everything from the um, not, not, no empathy whatsoever, the facial expressions that should be there aren't there. We're not seeing any emotion in her actions, in her words. We're not seeing anything we should be seeing there in, in a normal person. And if she was a psychopath, we would have been seeing at least some some kind of trying to connect with people to, to get a reaction, to get them to feel good and feel better about her. But I don't think she's smart enough to pull that off, but a psychopath would have figured that out and would be able to do that to get them to engage and get them to like her or try to. And whereas a sociopath in this situation, in my opinion, she's just trying to, she's just going through the motions because there's, no, there's nothing there emotionally um, that will 
let her engage with these things, with these situations like the suitcase. And like we're actually talking about the conversation she had with him while he was in there. So just my opinion. That's what it looked like to me. All right, fellas. Thanks for another good one. And we'll see you next time. See ya. <laughs> 